everybody. This is Dean Robinson, SummitCityNoise.com, and it's time to do the podcast. Let's get on with it. Yes, people, got a good show for you today. At least I think so. A lot of funny stuff happening to me lately. Now, again, when I say funny, it's just going to be the way I relate to this stuff. Some people are going to find what I do just confusing. It's going to anger a lot of people, and especially in this mainstream media scene in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Oh, my goodness, people. I'm having a blast out here, having so much fun with these uh, media types because I understand the split-mindedness of TV news, of corporate media news. My goodness, people, they are compromised from the word go. I mean, all these commercial messages you're seeing, I mean, that's these corporations and these banks and your government, you know, these military operations, these months just buying influence, buying influence from these media outlets, these TV stations and radio stations, running all these commercials, these paid ads. Well, the people paying for those ads, well, they called the tune. I mean, they just slipped a quarter in the jukebox, baby. Or, you know, now it's you put a $5 bill in the jukebox and you get some, uh, you know, five digital songs. But nonetheless, whoever's putting the money in the slot, that's who calls the tune. And so that's what you're going to get from this media system. And when I just talk about Fort Wayne, Indiana, I'm going to have some people saying, Oh, Dean, I'm listening to you in gay Paris. I don't care about the Le Fort Wayne. Well, people... Anywhere you are, you just have a media system just propagandizing you all the time. And it's just so open. Now, when I uh, went to the journalism school at uh, Indiana University, Bloomington, Indiana, well, when I went there, well, I got trained in all this English and journalism. Now, I, you know, I double majored English and then journalism, the school of journalism. So I'm learning how to read and write again, you know, doing this AP style. And then just learning all these um, these values, this morality of journalism, just how uh, you know you're supposed to protect your sources, but actually have sources. You know, you don't take payouts. You just do everything straight. I mean, even back in the day when I was in this broadcast journalism at IU, they're going to say, "Hey, this notion of these TV news stations just teasing you for a story, just saying, hey, there was a murder in Fort Wayne. Was it somebody you know? Tune in." Well. Back when I was in school, they said, you're not even supposed to do that. They do that all the time now. And so in school, you learn all this morality and journalism. But then when you get out in the real world, well, you find out, no, it's the advertisers calling the shots. These newspapers, well, the size of the newspaper, the number of pages, that depends on how many ads are in there. And so when it comes down to it, they will cut news. They will cut these reports of just people doing things, these endeavors and experience. These newspapers will cut that out because the ads have to go in there. The people that pay the bills, they get their word. And that's going to be reflected throughout the commentary and the news coverage. What gets covered, what doesn't. And then like Wayne TV and all these radio station groups just openly aligning, openly aligning with Tower Bank or Steel Dynamics, Indiana, Purdue, Fort Wayne University. I mean, just these open entanglements with these media operations running these news operations just totally compromised totally compromised so you got to understand this news and journalism is is separate stuff so news channel 15 just giving you news news is just reports whatever journalism is going to be a little bit more objective trying to get to the truth and presenting it fairly news no we're going to twist it and turn it however we want you're going to see this big time with this Aurora, Colorado movie theater massacre, the Bat Massacre, I've called it. You have enough detail on it. This James Holmes allegedly bursting into this movie theater in Aurora, Colorado during the uh, midnight showing of The Dark Knight Rises, the latest Batman movie, and, and allegedly James Holmes just starts blowing people away with an automatic weapon, automatic, you know, rifle. Guns, you know, shotguns, all of it, handguns, the whole deal. It's supposed to be these bombs he's setting off, allegedly. But these people, real victims, people really suffering mentally and physically in the hospital, all of it. And so you people have heard about this, all the different theories going around. But uh, it's really going to be all this talk about gun control and, um, and God. It's such a trip. 
getting all this uh, guns and God talk. And so, yeah, today I'm going to get to talk about Angry White Boy and and, uh, Ransom. You know, over at Angry White Boy, angrywhiteboy.org, one of these blogs, right wing blog in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Dan Turquette putting that out. You know, Angry White Boy, openly right wing, openly Republican, all of it. But he's going to, you know, that's open, going to be open. And so he's going to have Ransom doing these posts about, you know, guns and God, just drawing it all together, drawing it together. Now, what I'm going to find interesting out here is you have so many people who believe this um, this Second Amendment to the constitutions of the United States of America. They're going to think this Second Amendment gives people, allows people the right to bear arms, to have a weapon, to have a gun. So, you now, people, if you just believe that uh, a piece of paper with some words on it and some uh, white supremacist government, Backing that up, if you think that's where your rights come from, well, if you believe that, then you have to understand, well, that's where your rights can be taken away, that same entity. So if you think this Constitution gives you, as a human being, rights to do anything, well, you're absolutely foolish. Now, I'm going to be one of these people who used to be one of those fools, thinking this Constitution meant something for human beings. No, this Constitution has to do with the actions, the activities of government, of this federal government structure. You know, the government system provided by this union called the United States of America, a corporate union. And so this Constitution, you know, this uh, set of guidelines and just high-minded thoughts that these... uh, genocidal slave owners came up with back in, uh, you know, the, the late 1700s. Well, that stuff applies to government. It just mentions people, capital P, little p, citizens, capital C, little c, subjects. It just mentions those mugs. And then uh, it's up to government to follow this stuff or not. And then they can make up the rules as they go. That's why you have these amendments. These add-ons. And so this Second Amendment, Amendment 2, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So people are going to believe that, um, you know, well, that means the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. No. If um, If you break down the sentence... As you would if you were studying French or Spanish, it's just when you get to a higher level of intelligence, well, uh, your education system, they stop the notion of you breaking down these sentences in English. No, they don't want you doing that. They don't want you getting to the truth. That's why they switch you over to French or Spanish and German in high school so you can break down these sentences and these verb conjugations, tenses, really understand what's being said. And so let me break this down. A well-regulated militia, comma, being necessary to the security of a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, comma, shall not be infringed. So if you really want to know what's going on, you got to cut away these, uh, these phrases separated by these commas. You have to do that because those phrases separated by those commas, well, those are just adjectives. Those are just adjectives. They're describing the, the first part of this sentence, the subject. So cut away the stuff separated by the commas, and here's what you get. A well-regulated militia shall not be infringed. Let me read that again. A well-regulated militia shall not be infringed. So this notion of a well-regulated militia, that shall not be infringed. That's what shall not be infringed, a well-regulated militia, capital M. And then these other phrases, well, they're going to describe this militia. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. So a well-regulated militia is necessary to the security of a free state. A well-regulated militia 
is the right of the people to keep and bear arms. It is only within a well-regulated militia that this Constitution gives uh, people the right to keep and bear arms. And it's going to be these uh, slave-owning genocidal maniacs. They're the ones doing the giving. Just telling you <laughs> what right you have to keep and bear arms. These arms that do exist, use them to fight these Brits. We got them. But we're going to tell the people whether or not they can have them. And so a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the right of the people to keep and bear arms, a well-regulated militia is necessary for the right of the people to keep and bear arms. According to your Constitution, you have to be within a well-regulated militia to have the right to bear arms under this constitution. you got people out here grasping at that. And it's like, well, you mugs don't belong to a well-regulated militia. You don't belong to a, an Indiana state guard, which is now your Indiana national guard. It's been federalized. Just add it to the standing army. Your well-regulated militia. If you're not a member of that, well, this Constitution does not give you a right to keep and bear arms. No, you got to be in a well-regulated militia. And that is going to refer to the Militia Act of 1792, 1792, because this Second Amendment, it's going to be ratified December 15th, 1791, 1791, referring to this militia, capital M. And so December 15th, 1791. Well, now let's flash forward to May 2nd, 1792, the Militia Act of 1792. Okay. Providing for the authority of the president of the United States to call out the militia. So whenever the United States shall be invaded or be in imminent danger of invasion from any foreign nation or Indian tribe, you know, the people that already lived here, you know, Christopher Columbus from Spain, somehow discovering this land where this, these Indian tribes already lived. But according to the president of the United States, well, those mugs are just dangerous to us. These mugs that already lived here. So let me start again. Whenever the United States shall be invaded or be in imminent danger of invasion from any foreign nation or Indian tribe, it shall be lawful for the president of the United States to call forth such number of the militia of the state or states most convenient to the place of danger. Okay. So this militia act of 1792 capital M militia. Well, that's going to be this militia referred to in your second amendment. A well-regulated militia shall not be infringed. A well-regulated militia is necessary to the security of a free state. A well-regulated militia is necessary to the right of the people to keep and bear arms. This right of the people to keep and bear arms completely within this well-regulated militia. So what, what is a militia? And so, yeah, this mug is going to have, they're, they're going to break it down in 1792. They're going to break this down. So each and every free able-bodied white male citizen of the respective states resident therein who is or shall be of age of 18 years and under the age of 45 years shall severally and respectively be enrolled in the militia. Okay. So people, this militia, this militia, According to your constitution, a well-regulated militia shall not be infringed. Well, what's a militia? Well, it's um, free, able-bodied, white male citizens, 18 years of age to 45 years. That's your militia. That, those, those white guys within that militia, well, they're going to have the right to keep and bear arms. Okay? Because what it's going to be is that... Um, um, that every citizen so enrolled and notified, you know, that, you know, George Washington saying, Hey, you white guys, you white boys, white guys, every citizen so enrolled and notified shall within six months thereafter 
provide himself with a good musket or firelock, a sufficient bayonet and belt, two spare flints and a knapsack, a pouch and a box therein to contain not less than 24 cartridges. Okay. So um, with this uh, Second Amendment, well, it, it, it says that your militia, well-regulated militia, your government-regulated militia should not be infringed. And within that, this militia, well, the, the people in that militia, these white guys in the militia, well, they're going to have the right to keep and bear arms because when George Washington calls you, you have six months to get your own gun and musket and bullets. Are you getting this people? And so when I talk about this notion of white supremacy in your um, United States and you live under socialism in which your community owns or regulates trade and industry, that's what you have. You have all this government regulation. You have it. In some cases, you have the government owning, owning your trade and industry. Your, your federal government, the United States Treasury, still owning a piece of GM, still owns Ally Bank. That's GMAC financing, Ally Bank, just wholly owned by the United States government. But people love it. Mitt Romney loves it, and President Barack Obama loves all that socialism. They're going to say that automaker socialism, it had to happen. Any Republican knows that. And that's what we're getting out here, but no sense of it. And when I tell people, hey, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, these monks were slave owners. They ordered people to kill these natives that lived here so these British traders could own people and property that didn't belong to them. They just stole it. But if you're going to listen to, uh, you know, Pat Miller, when he used to be on Whoa, Whoa AM, he's just going to say, well, Dan, that was legal, right? Well, we got to go to commercial. That's going to be the discussion, or it's going to be, well, that's just the way it was, and that's what's going on. And so these mugs, you know, so bummed about this uh, this gun control stuff, these, these Christians, you know, God and guns, people, guns. Now, when you hear the word guns, you got to under, understand, well, that's one of these uh, code words, like when you hear urban and that's just supposed to mean these uh, darkies out here, the brothers, the Negroes, urban, urban. When you hear gang, well, you're supposed to think these uh, Negroes and these Hispanics, Hispanics. You're supposed to think that. These Mexicans, legal and illegal. So when you hear gang, you're supposed to think these uh, Latino, Hispanics, and these uh, Negroes, colored people. When you hear gang, when you hear gun, Guns, people, they're talking about white people. So when you hear, you know, uh, Mayor Bloomberg saying the police should take a hard stance on guns, what he's saying is police should take a hard stance on white people. Because if you know a white man with a gun, you know a white man with five guns. And you guys know it. You know it. I'm not even out here stereotyping. (laughs) No. You mugs know it. If you know a white guy with a gun, he's got five armed to the teeth. And when you hear about this gun control, you're, you're talking about white people control because it is the uh, well-regulated militia that shall not be infringed. And your well-regulated militia, it's your able-bodied white male from 18 to 45. And when you look at your, uh, your television ratings you know, and all this uh, advertising demographic stuff, what's the prize demographic? 18 to 49-year-old white males. It's your target demographic. (laughs) And when you look at your culture, these mugs love all this guns and mayhem. They love it. Producing it, pimping it, glamorizing it, all of it. All this heterosexuality with all the, you know, these guns. God and guns. God and white people. So when you hear guns and gun control, it's white people control. Now, when I go to uh, PIX11, you know, Dot com, one of these websites, one of these TV stations. So they're going to have this story from, uh, you know, Michael Bloomberg, you know, Mayor Bloomberg. So he's uh, going to say um, Bloomberg says police should take a hard stance on guns. 
So uh, Mayor Bloomberg has not been shy about using the Aurora, Colorado movie theater shooting to talk about stricter gun control. But did he cross the line Monday night when talking to CNN's Piers Morgan? Well, he knew nobody was watching Piers Morgan. That Brit? No. But Bloomberg said, I don't understand why the police officers across this country don't stand up collectively and say, we're going to go on strike. We're not going to protect you unless you, the public, through your legislature, do what's required to keep us safe. That's Mayor Bloomberg. Mm -hmm. Mayor Bloomberg in, um, you know, New York City. He just thinks the cops should go on strike. The cops should go on strike. I don't understand why the police officers across the country don't stand up collectively and say, we're going to go on strike. We're not going to protect you unless you, the public, through your legislature, do what's required to keep us safe. Now, you got to understand, in New York, they've got the Sullivan Act, also known as the Sullivan Law. Wikipedia will let you know this. The Sullivan Act, also known as the Sullivan Law, is a controversial gun control law in New York State. Upon first passage back in 1911, <laughs> upon first passage, the Sullivan Act required licenses for New Yorkers to possess firearms small enough to be concealed. So this handgun stuff, anything small enough be to be concealed, if you can conceal it. So if you can conceal that under a coat, well, yeah. That's small enough to be concealed. You have to have a license for that. Mm -hmm. Possession of such firearms without a license was a misdemeanor. Carrying such a firearm without a license was a felony. Mm -hmm. Felony. Okay? And so this, this law is still in force. And so what this is going to talk about, this Sullivan Act on Wikipedia, in which you have to have a license, you have to get permission to even own a, a firearm small enough to be concealed. Okay? So um, outside of New York City, the practice, the practices for the issuance of concealed carry licenses vary from county to county within New York State. In New York City, the licensing authority is the police department, which rarely issues carry licenses to anyone except retired police officers. Critics of the law, the Sullivan Law, have alleged that New Yorkers with political influence, wealth, or celebrity appear to be issued licenses more liberally. Mm -hmm. So this is going to say uh, only about 30,000 private non-law enforcement licenses exist out of almost 8 million residents. That's, that's in New York. So 8 million residents, only 30,000 of these uh, private licenses exist, 30,000. Other than that, it's just your cops and your state guard, your national guard. Those mugs get to be armed to the teeth. It's just the people, these almost 8 million residents. No, you can't have, you can't have a gun without permission, and we're not giving it out. And so this uh, Wikipedia is going to uh, have a list of current and past New York City license holders. These current and past New York City residents who were given permission to hold a um, handgun. Donald Trump, Robert De Niro, Howard Stern, Steven Tyler, and Joe Perry of Aerosmith. Say what? Steven Tyler and Joe Perry of Aerosmith. Now, I know Steven Tyler is the star of American Idol, and Howard Stern is the star of uh, America's Got Talent, even though he's one of the uh, most brazen sexists out here. But beyond sexism, that's not going to really weigh into this gun control discussion. But Steven Tyler and Joe Perry of Aerosmith, you know, these guys are known as the toxic twins because of their rampant alcoholism and addiction to heroin. These mugs have been trying to kick that stuff for decades, decades. Steven Tyler and Joe Perry of Aerosmith, the toxic twins, renowned for heroin and alcohol addiction. Well, these mugs, well, yeah, in New York City, well, Mayor Bloomberg and the cops say, well, yeah, Steven Tyler and Joe Perry, you guys need handguns. You need to be carrying those mugs concealed because who knows what's going to happen when you're out there trying to score this H on the street. It's rough out there. There's only so much of this stop and frisk that we can do of these black guys and these Hispanics. There's only so much we can do to try to keep you safe. Stephen Tyre and Joe Perry, 
when you're trying to score that age. I mean, uh, Mayor Bloomberg and these New York City cops, they know that Steven Tyler and Joe Perry of Aerosmith, they're going to need some smack to finish that new Aerosmith album on time. You know, these late night studio sessions, these guys are old. They need a boost. This uh, McDonald's McCafe, that's not going to do it. Steven Tyler and Joe Perry of Aerosmith might have to go score some age. They need these uh, concealed carry licenses in New York City. They need it. They need to be packing heat, the toxic twins. So that's what's going on, you know, while these black people, these black men, these African-American men, these colored men, Negro men, and Hispanics, well, they're just the victims of stop and frisk. They're going to say some 83 to 87 percent of these stop and frisks, well, they result in nothing, just an illegal shakedown. But Mayor Bloomberg and these cops say, well, that's what we need to do to keep you safe. And then other than that, we need to have safe houses in Brunswick, New Jersey, just doing all this surveillance in New Jersey, the New York City cops doing that. Going to have some guy in one of these news reports saying, hey, if you see something, call. If you see something, say something. Well, I'm seeing something. I'm saying something. I'm supposed to look at these apartment houses, these apartment, you know, rooms, and I'm going to find all this stuff that looks like 911, looks like terrorists, all these pictures of terrorists, all these maps and whatnot, these uh, police radios in, in New Jersey, in this hotel room. With all these these uh, photos of the next door building? Well, this mug's got to call the feds. Feds go check it out, and they're like, oh, no. This is just a New York City Police Department safe house in New Jersey. These mugs doing surveillance, but everybody says, there's no problem. As long as you're doing something that has nothing to do with police operations in New York, they can do it. Mayor Bloomberg encouraging it. That's what you have going on. All this gun control, white people control, but you can't control these mugs. They're out of control. And then you're going to count on these mugs to help you. And then the only black man out there is President Barack Obama, but he's a white guy. And even when these mugs have a discussion about guns, you know, they're going to say these are assault weapons. These assault weapons are just so terrible. These assault weapons. And so, people, what you've got out here, apparently, is you have uh, weapons and then you have assault weapons. So an assault weapon, well, you could use that to assault people. But these weapons, well, they're just, they're just there for defense. You can just defend yourself with a weapon. And, you know, at this Aurora, Colorado massacre shooting, I mean, you're going to have guys like, uh, you know, Casey Bartholomew, you know, failing his on-air audition on Whoa, Whoa AM this week. Well, this mug is going to say, uh, you know, these, there probably would have been more survivors had there been more armed people in, this, in the cinema. In the theater? So somehow, <laughs> these people like Casey Bartholomew, who's just, hey, we don't need any more gun control. We don't need any more white people control. Don't need any of it. And there would have been more survivors had there been more armed people in the audience. So then I guess there could have been just a, a, a shootout, just a three or four way shootout, just bullets flying everywhere. <laughs> And somehow that's supposed to just make everybody safer. I mean, these guys are absolutely nuts out here talking about this stuff. And, you know, it's, you're not going to get any sense out of it. And so, people, my notion is going to be, well, you can keep what you can defend. That's going to include your life. That's what you get to keep. And so at some point you may have to defend what you want to keep. Other than that, somebody will just take it from you. They may just take it from you, just snatch it. They may uh, point a gun at you and threaten you, or they may, you know, point a gun at you and threaten you. You're like, no, we're going to tangle. And then you got to fight for what is yours. It may happen. And that's going to be what determines what your rights are. You decide that. As long as you're waiting for guys like Mayor Bloomberg to decide for you or uh, potential president Mitt Romney. You think a guy that's worth uh, a quarter of a billion dollars, I'm not exaggerating. His wealth is $250 million. That's his wealth. That's his money. When you count up all his assets and savings and bonds and tax havens, yeah, Mitt Romney, $250 million. It's a lot of cash. But somehow you think that he's going to help you. He's somehow out here advocating for you. But these mugs are going to openly show you where we, we're being funded by all these banks and international financiers influenced by the same corporations 
who own your mainstream media. All these mugs just preaching a dependence on government. You just have to choose your flavor. You get Pepsi or you get Coca-Cola. You get McDonald's or you get Burger King. Those are your choices. Yes, they are different. But in the end, it's uh, at McDonald's and Burger King, it's still sugar, salt, and fat. Just maybe just a little bit different mix of each. It's just the same stuff, Coke or Pepsi. Choose whatever you want. Those are your choices. And somehow you people think you're going to get something different from one of them, from Romney or Obama. And you watch The Daily Show and The Colbert Report. They're going to show you they're talking up the same stuff, the exact same rhetoric. They both are. But somehow you people think they're different because Fox News is going to cut it a little bit different. And then, you know, NBC News is going to cut it a little bit different. But you people are going to think you're going to get something different from these sides. No. Everybody just preaching the same reliance on government, government, government. And so when you hear guns, gun control, they're talking about white people control. Because when you know one white man with a gun, you know a white man with five guns. You do. Gun control, white people control. They can't stand it. Can't stand hearing it. That's why you're hearing all this backlash. Mixing it with government. Government either allowing you to have weapons. And when you look at your constitution and your Militia Act of 1792, well, the militia is what's so important. This well-regulated militia. And that's white men. That prized demographic. 18 to 45. They said uh, 46 and up. No, we don't need you. We need you in your prime. 18 to 45. White males, free white males, you can get your guns. That's what these mugs can't stand. But they do have to uh, combine it with God. They have to combine it with God because that's how these uh, Republicans do it. Now, these Democrats, you know, the liberals, they're more going to say, well, let's leave this religion stuff out of it. Haven't we established that we can't make a law regulating religion or the establishment of it? You can't, you can't, you know, we're not supposed to do that. Just make laws regulating it. You know, but these Republicans are like, well, we need God in our government. We, we have to have it. We have to have God in our rhetoric. And so when I go to Angry White Boy, it's going to be, um, you know, again, this Fort Wayne blog. Angry White Boy, you're going to have a uh, Ransom. Ransom, who is a uh, apparently a, a Fort Wayne attorney or a local attorney, because he's going to talk about in his post, just how he went to court and just was, you know, helping advocate for his client for this free speech stuff in federal court. So Ransom, again, doesn't want to give his name, but he is a he. Ransom is hiding behind, behind a name, you know, but that's what he can do. That's his first, that's his first amendment right. So the constitution gives you that right, Ransom. And so you just happily, you know, exercising the right given to you. By these, um, you know, slave-owning genocidal maniacs. But nonetheless, Ransom is going to write on Angry White Boy, Common Sense Rises. Okay? So he's going to have this uh, page from the New York Post, Wednesday, July 25th, 2012. And the headline is, Gun Sales Surging in Wake of Dark Night Rises Shooting. So in regular United States form, whenever there is one of these uh, widely publicized mass shootings, it causes a surge in gun sales across the country. It's like a commercial for guns. It's like, hey, did you forget guns? You know, instead of the milk mustache, you just have a gunpowder mustache. Got guns? You know, got bullets? So gun sales just surge in the wake of Dark Knight Rises shooting. But um, Ransom on Angry White Boy, this gun sales surging, that's common sense rising. Common sense rises. And so the post, it just goes in immediately into scripture. I mean, Ransom just kicking scripture, people. So he's going to go to the Gospels, people. He's going to go to the Gospels. He's going to go to Luke Chapter 22, Luke chapter 22. Then Jesus asked them, when I sent you without purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they answered. He said to them, but now, if you have a purse, take it, and also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. It is written, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And I tell you, 
that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. The disciples said, See, Lord, here are two swords. That is enough, he replied. Luke 22. That's chapter 22, people, verse 35 through 38. That's the New International Version of the Bible, people. So, yeah, so Jesus is going to say, look, I sent you without a purse, bag, or sandals. I mean, when I sent you without a purse, bag, or sandals, I mean, you didn't have a purse or a bag. I mean, isn't a purse a bag? And so I'm going to be a little bit confused by this stuff that he's kicking, but you got to understand, he's pulling this from chapter 22 of the Gospel of Luke from this Bible. Now, I read the uh, King James Bible, and this chapter 22 you know, by the end of it, it's going to teach you a lesson in how words can be twisted and how your own words can be twisted. This book will show you chapter 22 of Luke. It will show you how the words of Jesus can be twisted. And so it is so awesome that ransom picks this up. Now, I will give you the proper context of this statement from Jesus talking about, hey, I sent you without a purse, a bag, or sandals. Did you, did you lack anything? No, we were great, Jesus. We didn't even have sandals. Didn't even have sandals. But now if you have a purse, take it. And your bag, take it. If you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. you got to do it. I'm reaching my fulfillment. What is written about me coming to its conclusion? See, Lord, we have two swords, two, two. We got two blades. That's enough. Jesus says that's enough. But the context that that ransom's giving you for that, this notion of, you know, sell your cloak, buy some swords. Well, the context that ransom gives you is gun sales surging in wake of dark night rises shooting. I'm going to give you the actual context. When chapter two begins, it says, now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. So what that means is uh, Passover is coming up, people. Passover is drawing nigh. It's coming up. Passover. Well, Passover, well, people, that's um, something that you're supposed to be remembering. If you're one of these Bible-following people, you know, so-called Christians, no. Mm -mm. Or Catholics, no. You're not following Passover. But your Bible will tell you you're supposed to. Jesus will tell you you're supposed to. Passover is when, you know, you're supposed to slay that lamb, take the lamb's blood, put it on your door frame outside, let people know, hey, look at the blood on this frame. And then that night, you know, you're supposed to be roasting that lamb. You roast that mug and you eat it. You gobble it up fast. But that uh, that blood on, on your outside, your, your door, well, that's going to tell the, uh, you know, the angel of death to just pass on by. Keep on going. You people get to live. And you're grubbing on that delicious lamb in there. I can smell it. So that's Passover. Supposed to be remembering that. Jesus will tell you that. And so this chapter 22, that's how this starts. Telling you the feast of unleavened bread is drawing nigh. Not a, a, a shooting at, at this movie theater. Like Ransom's going to lead you. Now, the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests, the priests and scribes, sought how they might kill him, kill Jesus, for they feared the people. So these priests, you know, the priests, like you mugs think these priests are good guys. Well, in these gospels, they're going to openly show you the priests are the bad guys. These priests seeking how to kill Jesus because they feared the people. They feared the people. But they're going to say, hey, Satan entered into Judas and Judas, hey, he conspired with these mugs to to, um, you know, give him Jesus so they can kill him. But, you know, Jesus, you know, as the day of unleavened bread, you know, Passover, when that day comes, well, uh, Jesus says, hey, uh, Peter and John, you got to go and prepare the Passover meal. So go into the city and prepare it. We got to keep the Passover, got to keep it. And so that's when they have this last supper. So this, um, this quote that Ransom gave you, an angry white boy, the proper context is the Last Supper, not gun sales surging in the wake of Dark Knight Rises, taking the words of Jesus and twisting them to gun sales surging. 
ransom on Angry White Boy using Luke chapter 22 to do it. And dude, I'm so grateful that you did. It's so awesome. I love it because I get it. Okay. So this is when Jesus is going to break the bread and offer the cup and say, hey, you know, th do this in remembrance of me. The cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. We're going to share this stuff. But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. And this is Jesus speaking here, people. And truly, the Son of Man goeth. And it was determined. But woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. So Jesus is going to call himself the Son of Man. The Son of Man. Not the Son of God. The Son of Man. And so Jesus is going to go on. The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. They're just benefactors. You know, the rulers just, just called helpers, just called job creators. These authority upon them are called benefactors. But ye, you apostles, ye shall not be so. You're not going to be these authority figures, these benefactors. You're not going to be them. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger and he that is chief as he that doth serve. So Jesus is going to let you know, look, just, you're, you're supposed to be the servant here. Don't worry about being the chief. For whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat or he that serveth, sitteth or serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat the greater? But I, Jesus, am among you as he that serveth. Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations. Yes. He's going to let you know, look, man, I'm among you as he that serves. And you guys that are surrounding me, these apostles, which have continued with me. Well, you've continued with me in my temptations, my temptations. So when I want to go to the club and party, kick it with these babes, you mugs are right there. You're willing to be designated driver right there. Simon, Simon. You know, Peter, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. So he's going to say, look, Simon Peter, I'm calling you Simon, not even Peter. I'm calling you by the old name, Simon. You, well, dude, you're not even converted. You're going to be my right-hand man. You're not even converted yet. But once you are converted... Well, then you can strengthen thy brethren. Then you can do it. And that's when uh, Jesus says, look, you're going to betray me three times before the, the cock crows. You're going to do it. That's what you're going to do. You know, because uh, Peter's going to say, look, Jesus, I, Lord, I am ready to go with thee, both into prison and to death. Now, pay attention here, people. Pay attention. And Jesus said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day. Before that, thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. And then the very next line. And he said unto them, when I sent you without purse and scrip and shoes, lacked ye anything? And they said nothing. Now, people, that should sound familiar. Well, that's where, um, that's where Ransom picked up the story. So... He didn't tell you any of that stuff about Passover or Judas being a traitor for money or, um, you know, them actually having this Passover supper and Jesus telling Peter what's going to happen. He didn't, he, Ransom didn't mention any of that. He just told you about the gun sales surging in wake of dark night rises shooting. That's the context that he gave you Jesus's words, twisting them into a context that's totally twisted. And so... When I sent you without purse and scrip, well, Ransom's going to say, when I sent you without purse, bag, or sandals. And so when I'm, I'm going to say, well, purse and bag, it's kind of the same. Because it's not purse and bag. If, you, if you're reading that New International Version, well, you're reading basically a photocopy of a photocopy. It's King James. So it's just a, a lesser, more watered-down um, translation, this New International Version. Because they're going to say, um, you know, purse, bag, or sandals. But it's purse, scrip. And shoes. So scrip, well, what is scrip? S-C-R-I-P? Well, that's money, people. That's money. Money. Not a bag. 
Why would you uh, talk about a purse and a bag? That makes no sense. But those are the words of Jesus, just those words themselves twisted, put in the context of gun sales rising after a Batman movie shooting. Angry white boy helping you out with that. These Christians, so Catholic. So, um, so Jesus says, when I sent you without purse and money and shoes, did you lack anything? And they said, nothing. I mean, dude, it was like walking on baby powder out there. What? No need. We were fine. Fine. We didn't have any money or purses. You know, purse is a bag. We didn't have a, a, a bag. We didn't have money. We didn't have shoes. But we were fine. So then he said unto them, but now he that hath a purse, let him take it. And likewise, his script. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Mm -hmm. For I say unto you that this is written must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors. For the things concerning me have an end. And so that's going to be kind of confusing to me because he's going to throw in that. And he was reckoned among the transgressors. Now it's going to be uh, it's going to be ransom giving you that he was numbered with the transgressors, but he doesn't give you any context of that. But as I go on, uh, I'll try to provide it. Okay, so uh, Jesus is going to say, "For the things concerning me have an end." So you take your purse and your scrip, and if you don't have a sword, well, let him sell his garment. But um. It's going to be ransom saying cloak, cloak. Well, cloak just sounds like some cloak and dagger stuff, like you're a spy, like you're trying to cover up. Well, in the King James, they're just going to say garment, you know, like a shirt or uh, some pants. You know, garment, just a piece of clothing, just an article of clothing, anything. Could be some, some socks. Well, just go sell some socks or a T-shirt. Go sell that and get a sword. But your cloak, okay. All right, whatever, ransom. And so, and they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, it is enough. And that's when uh, ransom, that's when he closes out. If you find this article informative, consider donating any amount you choose. Mm -hmm. And so he's going to let you know, ransom just letting you know, well, yeah, Jesus is just talking about gun sales surging. But what it's going to be is, well, after this, you know, this last supper, where they're going to say, well, look, Jesus, we have two swords here. We have two swords among us. Jesus and his apostles, two swords among them, two, two, two. But those mugs didn't go out and buy any more. No, they just said, look, we have two here. And Jesus said, that's enough. And so these mugs went to the Mount of Olives. And then Jesus said, pray that ye enter not into temptation. Pray that ye enter not into temptation. Because before Jesus already said, Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations. You haven't helped me um, reject any of these physical temptations. You guys haven't helped me. You just helped me continue with it. So I'm going to tell you to pray that ye enter not into temptation. Pray that you don't. But Jesus is going to go a little ways away from these mugs. A stone's cast away, kneeling down. A stone's cast. People, you could throw a stone pretty far. That's a long way. It's a long haul. So, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And so, uh, and there he, he, there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. So people, it's going to be this angel appearing unto Jesus because Jesus is going to say, look, father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And so an angel appears unto Jesus to strengthen Jesus and does strengthen Jesus. So that just helps Jesus pray more earnestly, just praying more, praying more. Father, are you sure about this cup stuff? Are you positive? I got to pray even harder with this new strength I just feel. Okay, praying harder. And this guy's sweating so hard. It is as it were great drops of blood falling to the ground. Now, it's not actually blood, but they're saying that's what it was like. That's how hard this guy was sweating it. But he rose up. He rose up. And then he uh, found his disciples sleeping from sorrow. And he's like, why sleep ye? Rise and pray. 
lest ye enter into temptation. You know, ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations. Why you guys, you guys wake up and pray so you don't enter in temptations. But then Judas comes up with his new crew, his new sellout crew. And he goes up to Jesus and kisses him. And Jesus says, Judas, betrayed thou the son of man with a kiss? You betrayed thou the son of man with a kiss? With a kiss. With a kiss. Judas, you betrayed the son of man. That's what Jesus says, the son of man. The son of man, the son of man. But the, nonetheless, these mugs, um, you know, it's going to say here, when they which were about him, the mugs with Jesus, saw what would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite him with the sword? And one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear with one of those swords. You know, because they had the two. So one of these mugs is going to say, Lord, shall we smite them with the sword? And one of them did smote the servant of the high priest, cut off his ear. And Jesus answered and said, suffer ye thus far. And he touched his ear and healed him. Suffer ye this far. Just, just thus far. You're suffering with that ear stop. You, whatever you've suffered in these last few seconds, well, that's going to stop. Because I'm going to put this ear back on your face and heal you. And then Jesus, he goes with these mugs, trying to bust them. He goes with them. He goes with them. Peter gets to deny him. He denies him. He denies him. But Jesus is going to be at this uh, little kangaroo court here, you know, with these uh, elders and priests. And so they're going to have this mug overnight. They're going to blindfold him and beat him up and just mock him and beat him up and say, you know, he's going to be blindfolded. These, these priests, these priests, they're going to be beating Jesus up blindfolded, just saying, hey, prophecy, who hit you? Lord, who hit you? You're so smart. And so as soon as it was day, the elders of the people and the chief priest and the scribes came together and led him into their council. They led Jesus into council saying, art thou the Christ? Tell us. And Jesus said unto them, if I tell you, you will not believe. And if I also ask you, you will not answer me, nor let me go. Hereafter shall the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. Are you getting this, people? That's the third time, just in this chapter, the third time. Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man, man with a little m, the people. Hereafter shall the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. He didn't say he is the power of God. He just says, hereafter shall the son of man sit on the right hand of the power of God. Okay. Jesus calling himself the son of man, not the son of God. Jesus calling himself the son of man three times in chapter 22 alone. Hereafter shall the son of man sit on the right hand of the power of God. Then said they all, all these scribes and priests, Art thou then the son of God? And Jesus said unto them, ye say that I am. You say that I am. You guys say I'm the son of God. And they said, the scribes and priests, they said, what need we any further witness? For we ourselves have heard of his own mouth. End of chapter. And so... That's what Ransom at Angry White Boy didn't want you to know. He just wanted you to tell, he just wanted you to think that Jesus says, go buy some swords, people. Sell your cloak so you can't hide yourself. Take your bag and your purse. You know, no mention of money. You're going to have to sell your clothes to get that. But Jesus is going to say, well, sell your, um, sell, sell your garment, buy a sword. But some of you mugs are going to have money. Just go ahead and buy a sword. But he is not wanting these mugs to use the sword. Because when, um, when one of these mugs asked Jesus, well, should we use this sword? You know, this, Judas just brings these mugs in here trying to bust you. Should we just smite one of these mugs with the sword? But Jesus doesn't even get a chance to answer. He doesn't answer. The, this mug just slices off this guy's ear. But Jesus picks up the ear and heals it and says, look, I'm going to go with these mugs. Even though these mugs just coming out at night. You know, using the power of darkness, 
This is their hour, you know, the late night hour. In the midnight hour, you know, when you do a uh, midnight showing of the dark night rises. Mm-hmm. That's when these mugs come and do bust Jesus. Jesus' crew want to cut these mugs up with those swords that Jesus was talking about. But Jesus is, mm-mm. he didn't even get to say it. He didn't even get to say no. He is to show you no by putting that ear back on, healing it, and then just going with these mugs because that what was written. Jesus knew it. He's going to go with these mugs so we can keep saying, I'm the son of man. I'm the son of man, son of man. You guys say I'm the son of God. You guys saying that. But then these priests, just the authority, where they're going to say, we don't need any further witness. We ourselves have heard it of his own mouth. Jesus said he's the son of God. Jesus said it, but he never said it. And that right there, Luke 22, chapter 22, going to show you just that chapter. Going to show you how the word of Jesus is manipulated in the Bible itself. Going to show you. And Ransom is going to pick that out for you so that you um, right-wing Christians can keep making the connection between God and guns, God and white supremacy. Yeah, people, let me mosey on into the sunset with my six-shooter by my side. Because I'm a free man out here. I do what I want. I don't count on this Constitution to give me rights. It, it doesn't. It just refers to what government can and can't do. But then it's up to government to decide whether or not they want to do that. And if they don't do stuff and somebody wants to appeal, well, you have to use the government to do all this appealing. It's completely crazy. Yeah, people. And so when you hear these code words, urban, that's Negro. Gang, that's Negro and Hispanic. Illegal, that's Hispanic. Guns, white. White people, guns. So just keep that in mind. Now, it's a trip when you uh, go through um, so much of this stuff. When you go through this, um, just this United States. Now, when you go to uh, the CIA website, CIA, Central Intelligence Agency, the work of a nation, the center of intelligence. Well, you know, they're going to break down, you know, this uh, population, these demographics of um, the United States. You know, the population, 313 million people, more than 313 million people, closer to 314 million as of July 2011, 313 million. Okay, so ethnic groups, white, 79.96 percent, white, black. 12.85%. 12.85%. Asian, 4.43%. Amer- Indian and Alaskan Native, 0.97%. Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islander, 0.18%. Two or more races, 1.61%. Whoa. White, Black, Asian, Amer- Indian, Alaska, Hawaiian, Pacific Islander. What, what about Hispanic? Where, where are they? I thought these mugs supposed to be just the biggest minority. Note. Central Intelligence Agency letting you know in their World Bat Book. Note, a separate listing for Hispanic is not included because the U.S. Census Bureau considers Hispanic to mean persons of Spanish, Hispanic, Latino origin, including those of Mexican, Cuban, Puerto Rican, Dominican Republic, Spanish, and Central or South American origin living in the U.S. who may be of any race or ethnic group, white, black, Asian, etc. Are you getting this? A separate listing for Hispanic is not included because the U.S. Census Bureau considers Hispanic to mean any person living in the United States of any race or ethnic group. Are you getting this, people? So then they're going to say about 15.1% of the total U.S. population is Hispanic. About 15.1% of the total U.S. population may be of any race or ethnic group. White, black, Asian, whatever. Are you getting it? It makes no sense. It makes no sense. Now, people are going to think with this uh, white, this white and black people, it doesn't mean anything. I mean, just, just some words. White people. Well, white is the color of milk or fresh snow. The opposite of black. Figuratively, figuratively, morally or spiritually pure, innocent, untainted. That's why. Just so innocent and untainted. Well, what about black? What about black? Because that's going to 
have to do with any group having dark colored skin? Well, figuratively, it's going to be characterized by tragic or disastrous events causing despair or pessimism. Just full of gloom or misery, very depressed. You know, full of anger or hatred. Very evil or wicked. Black, so black people. Very evil or wicked people. Black people. Tragic, disastrous people. Pessimistic people. Gloom and misery people. Depressed people. Black people. White people, you're just innocent. And so bright. You're like driven snow and innocent. White people. But when you use those terms, people are going to say, well, it doesn't mean anything. And Hispanic? Hispanic? It really doesn't mean anything. Hispanic could be any race or ethnic group. People, you're just being played on every level out here. Just being played. But I got to go. I'm Dean Robinson. SummitCityNoise.com. I'll talk to you soon.